as the flood is about destroying ecosystems. Whereas in an evolutionary view, uh, these ecosystems are going to have to arise a little bit more gradually as organisms diversify and evolve and respond to one another in their environment. But that's not what you see. Instead, you see an explosion of life that is complex, whole, the ecosystem is integrated with one another. You can see where all the different organisms fit mm -hmm. with respect to one another. And that's just the first time that that happens. Every time you move up in the geological column in this fossil record, you start seeing snapshots of more and more ecosystems. You've got one ecosystem that's destroyed, and then you've got another one. It's got slightly different creatures, there's different interactions going on, mm -hmm. and as the floodwaters move higher and higher, they're getting closer and closer to shore, destroying more and more organisms in the shoreline and eventually up onto land. Yeah. So I, I think I see what you're saying here, and that is that the paradigm that uh, we're all taught, that conventional paradigm, is trying to tell us that the fossil record is an evolutionary picture of life as it is developing, as opposed to the Genesis paradigm that's saying, no, all of that life, all the complexity of life already was there, yeah. and now we're looking at the graveyard of all that life. Exactly. Well, what are some of the other data that you're seeing that, that convinces you of this paradigm? Sure. Well, one very curious situation with the fossil record, so if thinking vertically about things, mm -hmm. is not the hard parts of the animal, but the trackways. They're the footprints. This is a pattern that we see in several different groups where their footprints are first and their body parts are later. Mm -hmm. For the trilobites, for the amphibians, for the dinosaurs, the first time I find evidence of them in the fossil record, it's from trackways, not the hard parts. From an old earth perspective, that's really weird and hard to grapple with because you have millions of years between the trackway production and ultimately the animal that made it. Mm -hmm. But that obviously doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Because right. if there's trackways, there's animals, and those animals have bones and teeth and shells mm -hmm. to them, why aren't they fossilized? Instead, the pattern's yeah. telling us something different. There's no time between when somebody yeah. leaves a track and when somebody gets buried. But the fact that those trackways are still there, that, that should tell us something as well, shouldn't it? One, it tells us that the deposition or the, the placement of the next layer on top of them had to happen very, very quickly. Because, again, you go out onto uh, a beach and you walk in the sand, your trackways are, are destroyed very, mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. But the fossil record is showing us something very different from today. This is death in a moment, right? yes. this is death in an instant. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a, a world that was complex, whole, integrated, and the flood is destroying that world sequentially mm -hmm. and burying it in a vertical fashion. Yeah. And so I think looking at the fossil record as a record of life is partly correct, but it's not about life's development. It's about life's attempt to survive an event that ultimately consumed all of them. Well, that would make sense then because when God was talking about destroying the earth uh, with the flood, it wasn't just the destruction of human life, it was the destruction of all life. And so now the world we live in is, as you said, radically different than what that was before. Yeah, when we look at the T-Rex, when we look at the Mosasaurs, when we look at uh, all these animals as ferocious carnivores, and they really are, I mean, they're terrifying, but that's not what they were initially created to be. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. these sharp teeth, these devastating claws, and the behaviors that go along with them all seem to be part of the curse. And part of that is genetic, part of it might also be just you know, some modifications, but mm -hmm. uh, these organisms, by the time we see them, and this is important for us to remember when we come to a natural history museum, is you're not seeing the world at creation week. Right. You're seeing the world as it existed at the flood. And that world was one that was filled with violence yeah. and was, was a, a pretty terrible place to be. I realize that the billions of creatures buried in those layers are a silent testimony to God's global judgment. I decided I wanted to see one of those layers of fossils for myself. If the dinosaurs had died suddenly in the flood, wouldn't it be obvious? What we're dealing with here, this is in the Lance Formation. This is a Upper Cretaceous sedimentary deposit. And what we have here is a, what's called a bone bed. It's, a, it's a, an accumulation of bones that's about a meter thick, a little less than a meter. And in this meter, we find the bones present as a graded bed with little bones at the top and uh, bigger bones at the bottom. And you can see here, it looks like 
Dr. Linné is working on another vertebra here. This is a cervical vertebra of a, a duck-billed dinosaur. This is where the spinal cord goes right there. When I, when I look at these bones in the quarry, I, I often think of them as being inside the animal alive oh, and just uh, imagine no, what, sure. it's, what it's like to be seeing these bones for the first time. So, so this is just full of bones and, and it's not like we have to go looking for where the bones are. We just have to sit down and start digging. What is mainly different about the sites that you're digging here as opposed to what we would say a general dinosaur dig somewhere? Well, there, there are dinosaurs found all over the world, but this particular site is unique in that it's probably one of the largest collections of bones in the world. And there are the remains of between, I'd say between five and 10,000 animals, each 20 to 40 feet long in this, in this deposit. These are big animals and there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Let's step back for just a second. <laughs> okay, so we had a, we had a duck bill dinosaur roaming around the earth and all of a sudden it dies. Would it become a fossil? Fossilization requires very special circumstances. Normally, we know, for example, if a, if a coyote dies out in the desert, it's, his body is soon gone. Yet these bones are all perfectly preserved. They have never been subjected to weather. They are just all there. They, today, it would be very difficult to imagine how you could do that. To some extent, we would really say that to find a fossil is rare. Even though we have many, many fossils, in terms of things that die, it's right. rare if they become fossilized. It is rare. It requires special circumstances. Mm -hmm. Not the least of which is rapid burial. These, these animals had to die, and then their carcasses had to have time to rot. So we're talking days or weeks or months, during which time the, the bones and tissues were either eaten away or rotted away. And then the bones that remained were deposited instantaneously in, in this environment because they're in a graded bed with big bones at the bottom and little bones at the top. And you can see that here. The big bones are all down at the mm -hmm. bottom. And when they start digging up here, they start to find smaller bones. So that condition requires a sorting process that can only take place during a catastrophic emplacement. So when we look at the dinosaur fossils, rather than looking at them from the standpoint of we have early dinosaurs, then middle dinosaurs, and later dinosaurs, you're looking at for from the perspective that all those dinosaurs were in existence. They were all living, and then there was this huge catastrophe that brought them to an end. The dinosaurs are already dinosaurs when they first, when they first appear. They look just like anyone would see, think a dinosaur looked. And this is an enigma for, for those who believe in the evolution of the dinosaurs. But we hear a lot about transitional forms. What's, what's the real story there? Scientists have been able to lay out some forms they think are transitional and some of them are very interesting some even challenging but they are the exceptions to the rule the rule is there are no transitional fossils and what we find in the fossil record and contra to darwin's hopes this is the rule is that a form exists in the fossil record it basically stays unchanged and it disappears from the fossil record without having been changed that's got to mean something besides evolution because we don't ever see changes from this form into this form in the, in the rocks themselves. So it's coming from somewhere else. It's, it's, a, it's a paradigm that's being imposed on the data rather than the data providing the paradigm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very easy for me to be a creationist just based on my understanding of the complexity of life forms and when we look at the fossil record, we can see that the complexity is all there from the beginning, and this, this begs the question of where did all this complexity come from? It's one thing to have faith. I have faith that God was the creator, but that's substantiated by what I see around me. Mm -hmm. To say I have faith that it, evolution produced this when I can't even see how it could have happened, that's blind faith. That's a leap in the dark. That's a leap in the dark. It seemed that everywhere I looked, there was a growing body of evidence that fit the historical record of Genesis. It wasn't just one thing, it was many things pointing in the same direction. When I was with Art, he told me about some recent discoveries of material inside dinosaur bones. So I traveled to a lab in Arizona to talk to a scientist who was doing some of that research himself. 
this is a fragment of a triceratops horn. Mm. Uh, when we pulled it out of the ground, it fragmented. And then, of course, we've had to continue to fragment it in order to do analysis of it. Uh, in 2012, the Creation Research Society sponsored Mark Armitage and I to go to the Hell Creek Formation in Montana, which is a very popular place for finding dinosaur bones. And we instead dug out a almost four foot long Triceratops brow horn. Now, it's just in crumbled pieces now, so we can't really, you know, put it together and show uh -huh. you a horn. But yeah, you have to recognize that pieces such as this we have found tissue with cells well, that's and potentially protein such as collagen. It's so difficult to understand how you could have this material still in a dinosaur fossil that is supposed to be 65, 75, 80 million years of age because mm -hmm. tissue, cells, proteins break down. They don't just, they're not concrete, they don't just exist for eons of time, they break down. And in fact, they tend to break down fairly quickly depending upon the conditions. And mm -hmm. certainly in Hell Creek, the conditions would be warm up, cool down, warm up, cool down. And any biochemist can tell you that is the fastest way to destroy material. It's difficult enough to envision it surviving for four or 5,000 years, but 60 million years, mm -hmm. 70 million years, see that really becomes very difficult to make any kind of biochemical basis for how it could have survived. Okay, so once you find uh, a, a sample like this, mm -hmm. what do you do next? So what we do is we soak the fossil material in a solution called EDTA. And what you'll have after you dissolve the fossil is the tissue will be remaining because the EDTA won't dissolve the tissue. So right. then I'll bring this over to uh, what we call a dissection microscope. Mm -hmm. This is, in essence, dissolved Triceratops horn magnified. And so you can see what it looks like, just kind of little, little pieces of rock. Well, Kevin, what did you find then uh, when, you, when you were looking at the sample and you actually found some, some tissue? Okay, here's what we found. This is actually Triceratops tissue. It's stretchable, it's pliable, it's mm. not an impression of the soft parts of the dinosaur. This is truly soft. It is squishy. It is stretchable. It is tissue. That blows your mind, huh? Absolutely. And if you look at them then at a closer magnification, what well, we see then, this is using scanning electron microscopy, you see the extreme detail of the cells. Okay. In that picture, in this picture, and particularly like look at this picture, we would not expect, begin to expect to see such enormous and elaborate detail. I mean, these structures are incredibly small. You notice this is our 20 micron bar here. See how small these structures are, still intact. Yeah. It would take very little to break those. Mm. So at best, you would expect that all that would have broken off and been long gone. Mm -hmm. So that has, has to have shaken up the scientific community. What's been the response of all of this? The initial response, when Dr. Schweitzer first published her work, which is what became very popularized in 2005, it generated a lot of response. And so initially, some of the reaction was rejection. Oh, it's contamination. You know, that's, a, that's oh. not really dinosaur. It, mm. It's bacteria, because bacteria can look kind of strange sometimes. So you had a lot of proposals of what it could be. And to her credit, Dr. Schweitzer did more work. They began to find protein. You break open some of these cells. You look in the, at the matrix these cells are attached to, and they're protein. Okay, so once that is uh, understood, yes. then what happens? Now, this is shaking it up, I guess. That becomes part of the controversy, because clearly you're now faced with how could you explain the survival of this, the pristine survival. Mm of this, not only for so long, but in very unpristine conditions. Mm -hmm. And so then the controversy has been, how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. And if you read some of the literature, there's almost like desperation of, because they recognized what the implications of this could be. Now, some people would claim, well, it means nothing because we know how old they are, and therefore it just means it survives somehow, big deal. 
But how do you know how old they are? Well, you use methods, supposed methods of dating. Well, this is a method of dating. The tissue itself can't be discounted as part of a method sure. of dating. So why do you say that doesn't count, but this does count? Well, it's all the paradigm drives your conclusions. The paradigm is it has to be old. Therefore, methods that give us an old fossil are what we choose. Something that doesn't give us an old fossil, like tissue, we have to reject or explain away. Mm -hmm. At least to me, and I, of course I'm not a microbiologist, but I think most people uh, would say, well, that, that just seems reasonable to think that maybe these are not that old. Clearly, this is in violation of the dating process. It challenges the entire dating process. Yes. If the fossils of dinosaurs have been dated incorrectly, which I would say this is clear evidence they have, then it's very likely the fossils of any organism been dated incorrectly, and therefore then the geologic agents themselves are incorrect. What you're saying is that if you pull out the notion of a long period of time, uh, you're pulling out a major foundation mm -hmm. Uh, for the conventional paradigm. Absolutely. In fact, time is the critical component for evolution. If you're going to say that a simple cellular system became a multicellular system that then became fish, and the fish then jumped up on land and grew legs and started breathing air, and then that creature grew feathers and wings and started flying, so if you give us time, we'll claim to account for all of this massive change of organisms. But we gotta have the time. Everything seemed to come back to the question of time. I remembered Andrew saying that Charles Darwin accepted millions of years first, then fit his theory of evolution to that assumption. Why is time such an important element to evolution? Rob Carter is a marine biologist, so he took me scuba diving to get a glimpse of a world most people don't see. His specialty was coral, and he knew a lot about the incredible creatures that inhabit the reefs around St. Thomas. Oh man, we got the sharks here. I mean, just look how they move, and it's almost like effortlessly glide along. I wish I could swim like that. Engineers wish we could make boats like that. Yeah. Submarines that can move as efficiently as a shark. We can't quite do it. So from your perspective as a marine biologist, and I know that you've studied the whole area of genetics a lot. Yes. When people talk about evolution, what is it? I define evolution. The word means change over time. But I believe in change over time, but I'm not an evolutionist. So how does one figure this out? Really, evolution is a belief that enough change over time, over enough time, can lead to the common ancestry of all species okay. on Earth. All right. So that's the part I reject. Of course, species change. I mean, look at these sharks here. We have several different species of sharks. When God created, he put into those organisms the ability to change, to adapt, to respond dynamically mm -hmm. to the environment. But there are still sharks. And when we look at the fossil record, there are still sharks. Mm -hmm. you know, people have heard the phrase, the missing link. And they usually think of between man and monkeys. No, there's missing links between almost every major group of animal and almost every other major group of animal and plant, even bacteria, throughout the entire fossil record, which indicates very strongly that these are actually different creations. So we don't get one kind becoming another kind. No. Evolutionary theory requires that small, random changes can explain everything we see. Mm -hmm. But it can't. And why can't it? Because life is so complex that small changes can't explain it. Just like you can't take a computer operating system mm -hmm. and look at it and say, oh yeah, this is built up one digit <laughs> at a time right. over any length of time. No, it took an intelligent person to sit down and put it together. Well, I can guarantee you as one who was in that world that if anyone in the area of computer science were to say, if we just randomly change some things in this operating system, it'll get better. I oh, mean, no. no one would agree with that. No, we're not gonna get the shark to evolve into a bird. That the, the number of changes and the types of changes are not something that you can do one change at a time. This is a sea urchin. 
It looks spiny. Yeah, it's pointy. You gotta be careful. Am I gonna get stuck if I touch no, it? No, no, no. He's pointy, but... Oh my goodness, they're, they're moving. Yes, they're moving. And in between the spines are little tube feet, especially on the bottom. Oh, look at that movement. So he oh walks goodness, with his yeah. spines, huh. but his little tube feet in here, and that's what he uses to grab onto things. But look, looking carefully, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are actually 10 radial parts to this animal. Huh. Actually, the starfish is his cousin. Are you serious? You can't be serious. Absolutely. The starfish here is also an echinoderm, but notice he has five-fold symmetry instead of uh -huh. 10. Yeah. This starfish does. On the bottom, look. We see the spines, we see the tube feet. His mouth is in the center there. Huh. So there is some similarity here, even similarity though externally it looks a lot different. A lot different. Actually, you want to see something that looks a lot different? Sure. Which is a cousin to the starfish and okay. the sea urchin. All right. It almost looks like a rock. Yes, yes. I got to be careful. He's squirting on me. This is a sea cucumber. He has spines. He has huh. two feet. Oh, my goodness. You would never know it until you studied really hard that this also is an echinoderm. He's not very happy being out of the water, so let me put him back in. Yeah, so these are all related, even though they look very, very different. Related in their creation. Uh -huh. Not in an evolutionary sense, but our creator took this phylum of life, the echinoderms, and created this and this and this on a similar pattern. And that's what we see across the entire realm of life, uh -huh. similarities and differences. So what makes them different? Well, genetically, they share most of their genes in common but there are developmental genes they're called hox genes that set up these patterns in the animal as it develops they develop from a single cell then in one of them they set up a five-fold symmetry another they set up a ten-fold symmetry another one they make this long skinny animal they control the development of the embryo in these amazing ways so what you're saying when we look at this from a um, a molecular or genetic perspective, uh, what we're finding is really a fascinating design in all of that. Absolutely. But what we've heard in the conventional paradigm, the conventional story tells us that it's those random changes that has brought about all of this. Sure. Back in the 1800s, when life was simple, mm -hmm. when they didn't know what was happening inside the cell, they didn't know how complex genetics was, you could imagine all sorts of things. But now that we know what actually happens behind the scenes, mm. the story gets a lot more complicated. You see, I like to say that the genome is four-dimensional. Mm. Well, we have a one-dimensional string called DNA. And if you want to draw that out, you'd have to write all the letters of DNA out on all three billion of them. And then you have to draw lines or arrows from one part to another part because this part turns this part off, this part interferes with this, this part enhances this. It's this huge two-dimensional interaction network. And that's why you have a two-dimensional genome. Hey, I mean, let me stop here All for right. a second because this is really amazing to think about this because um, I think in terms of a computer program that it's fairly static. I mean, yeah. the instructions are there. But you're talking about a program that is reprogramming itself. Oh, it's okay. modifying its own instructions. Oh, wait till I get to the fourth dimension. Oh, okay. Because the third dimension first. The information in that first dimension, that linear string, has to be organized in such a way that when it falls into the third dimension, it still works. Oh, well, that's amazing. Genes that are used together are next to each other in 3D space. Oh, are you saying that once this thing gets folded up, it's almost like we have a new set of instructions? Yes, a new level of information. Unbelievable. That whoever programmed that first level needed to understand what was going to happen, have it work in the third level. But you said there's another dimension. Even. Oh, yeah. The fourth dimension is time. And how does that work? The genome changes shape over time. Maybe you eat something that's bad for you, and your liver says, I can get rid of that toxin. Now, the chromosomes in the liver will change shape, <laughs> expose that new protein gene, make copies of it, build a brand new protein that can kill off that toxin, and when it's not needed anymore, they'll change shape again and fall back. Oh my goodness. Dynamic programming, all three levels change in the fourth level time rob that's so far beyond anything that we know even in our most complex software systems that it it's almost beyond imagination to think 
that someone would look at that and say it all happened by chance. Yes, and it only brings glory to God. It does. You can't build something like that up one thing at a time. You need it to function. In, in all this interlocking four-dimensional complexity, it's not something you can do one letter at a time with natural selection. Mm -hmm. It all has to be there. Yeah, in the same way when we talked about the environment out here on the coral reef, if you don't have all these interlocking pieces of that puzzle, you don't have that ecology. The system will come crashing down if you just remove a couple of very important mm -hmm. factors that are there. They have to be together or it doesn't happen. So not only did we have this uh, interdependency, this mutualism, so to speak, down at the genetic level, now we even make it more complex by saying there is that same mutualism at the higher level, isn't it? Yes. In fact, the entire world has a mutualism. It's impossible to think that all of this could have happened just by a series of slow processes over billions of years. That's exactly what I'm saying. It's clear that the world we live in is incredibly interdependent, from the smallest biological system to the largest ecosystem. There are complex mutual relationships everywhere. I realize that creation in six days makes the most sense from an engineering perspective. You need everything working together at the same time for everything to function properly. And that's exactly how Genesis says God created it. Rob also said God created animals with the ability to change and adapt to their environments. Is it possible this ability to change has been mistaken for evolution? As Todd Wood and I walked through the zoo, we saw incredible beauty and amazing design wherever we looked. I noticed the great diversity between some animals, as well as the remarkable similarity of others. As a biologist, what do you see when you see all of these creatures? Yeah, when I look at this, look at these lions specifically, I'm seeing cats myself. And all the other cats they have here at the zoo, they all have this underlying catness to them that's really apparent. It's really apparent when they start playing, right? You're seeing them playing with some sort of ball or something, and they look... They're just like a cat. They look like <laughs> a cat. You know, scientists would put that into a family called felidae. And I would understand the felids to be representatives of a single created kind. So the continuity, the similarity there is so significant that I'd say, yeah, these guys have all descended from a single pair of critters hmm. that was on the ark and that eventually generated all the different sorts of cats that we have today. So rather than just uh, an, a random accident, it appears as if all of these different species are coming from a really elaborate <laughs> design. Oh, absolutely. And it's not just a design like God, you know, designed and created the lion. It's God created something that could make a lion. Mm -hmm. So it's more like, you know, a multi-tool or a Swiss Army knife where you got all these pieces that you can just pop out whenever you need them, but it's all just one thing. So give me some other examples of created kinds. Yeah, so you've got the grizzlies and the polar bear. Those are all members of the bear kind. You've got ducks, swans, and geese. The thing about the dog kind is really interesting. So you take just this wolf-like creature, and we can breed in only a few hundred years many different breeds. Well, Todd, that's kind of fascinating now to think about what God was doing when he was bringing... Uh, two of every kind. What do you think was going on there? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he doesn't have to bring every little variety onto the ark. So mm -hmm. when you actually do the calculations, and okay, so we don't know exactly how many created kinds there were on the ark, but maybe a couple thousand, and they're small. Most animals are quite small, so you have room to spare, literally room to spare. Mm -hmm. And all of that diversity that we have today is built into those two of every kind. Well, Todd, we're looking at the zebras, and they're all unique, and yet all of these creatures, there's just so much complexity and diversity. How does the standard story, the conventional paradigm, explain all of that? Well, they would use evolution, right? So millions of years, random variations, all things that are alive now, that cactus, that zebra, grass here, it's all related. We all go back to a common ancestor that lived billions of years ago. And through the process of mutation and genetic variation, 
uh, and natural selection, that's where we get the stuff that we have today. So natural selection, uh, what is it? Does it have the kind of creative potential that we need for all of this? Natural selection uh, is basically all about killing off things that aren't fit for the environment. So if you're a finch in the Galapagos and you have a really tiny beak and the only food available to you is really big hard seeds, you're gonna die. And that's exactly what we observe. And so we can watch over the generations as the beak size of finches change in the Galapagos. But they're still finches, they're still birds, the notion that natural selection can generate all of the diversity we see, that's not been demonstrated. Mm -hmm. What we find most often with natural selection is that natural selection does a lot of fine tuning. So right over here, we've got these oryxes, right? Beautiful creatures and very, very pale colors. The wild range of the oryx is right on the southern end of the Sahara Desert. And so you can see, mm -hmm. yeah, their coloration makes sense. If you get a really dark colored one, that's gonna be really easy for predators to find. Mm -hmm. And so they end up being these really beautiful light colors. Uh, and that's an example of where selection would take a variation and turn it into an adaptation. Mm -hmm. And that brings us back to the notion that a really exquisite design in the beginning. Oh, I has, think so. Oh, has, absolutely. Mm -hmm, has you, provided these creatures with the ability to survive and to, to change uh, for their benefit. Absolutely. So the ability to be able to change your coloration like that, to be able to fit an environment, that's got to be built into the system before mm -hmm. it starts. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, natural selection and random variation can do amazing things. I mean, it, it's pretty astonishing the kinds of changes that we can see, but we don't see one kind changing into another. All we see are variations that happen within a created kind. Mm -hmm. So there's a felid tree, which has all the cats on it. There's the canid tree, which has all the dogs on it. There's the ursid tree, which has all the bears on it. There's the equid tree with all the horses on it. Each individual created kind then has its own individual tree so that you end up with something like an orchard or a forest. As a scientist, it seems what you're saying is that the Genesis paradigm answers all of this data better. Ultimately, I think it does, because it embraces both similarity and difference. Now, as we've already said, there's just, there's lots of questions that are still out there. But uh, I'm pretty confident, given what our paradigm can explain, I'm very confident that those answers are going to be found. After we left the zebras, we made our way to the gorillas. Todd wanted to talk about the question of human evolution. Todd, we see it all the time, a new discovery, new skulls, new skeletons that supposedly solidify this whole link. Yeah. What do you see there? Absolutely. Well, I got some right here in my bag. Ooh, a skull. So this guy is a Neanderthal, very, very low forehead. So we have really tall foreheads. Mm -hmm. Um, the face, the mid face has been pulled out, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, well, it looks very human. So that's Neanderthal, okay. you wanna hold that yeah. one for me? Yeah. Okay. We have others that are very different. Oh yeah. Now this one is Australopithecus africanus. So you can see really no forehead at all. It just slopes right back. Mm -hmm. Very, very small brain case. Uh, muzzle sticks way out. So the face is sloped forward. What do you do with this stuff? I mean, there's many more that we could show, many more pictures, many more skulls, and you can see looking sure. at the looking yeah. at them together, they're really, there's a lot of difference yeah. there. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. So all that created kind stuff that we already talked about, I can show again and again and again with multiple studies that I can find a discontinuity between humans and non-humans. So this thing lands on the human side. This Neanderthal here, it's one of us. This thing is not. Mm. It is different. But this would be just another one of those varieties of living things that God made mm. in the beginning and that survived the flood aboard the ark. So when we look at uh, Neanderthal man, uh, we're looking at uh, a human. Uh, but it's a human that just like we find in dogs, we have a lot of variety of, of dogs. We got a lot of variety of people. So even looking back here at the gorilla, we can see the obvious differences between us and him, not the least of which is that he's in there and we can go home when we're done. And so those differences are really huge, aren't they? 
I, yeah, absolutely. The image of God entails this idea of being God's representative here on this earth. Part of that then is having dominion and having authority. Spiritual quality that we have yeah. that we don't share uh -huh. with animals like that. Yeah. It's obvious we're different from the rest of creation because we're made in God's image. We're the only ones to create zoos so we can see the beauty of God's animals. And we're unique in tracking time and wanting to know our own history. But where does our concept of time come from? It was a beautiful night. Danny took me far outside the city and kept me up very late in order to show me something I will never forget. Oh my goodness, now you're gonna make me buy a telescope. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we have some purposes given for the stars in, in Genesis 1, 14 to 19. That's day four uh, creation account. It mentions the stars and other heavenly bodies mm. to mark time, to rule over the night, to be for signs, seasons, festivals, and so forth. Uh, people have been using the stars for, for marking passage of time. Mm -hmm. The uh, patterns repeat every night, they repeat every year, they, they come back in their season. There's a lot of regularity going on here. Uh, what about the design of the sun and the moon? Well, there are a couple of things I can talk about. On rare occasions, the, the moon passes between us and the sun. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen very often. And when that happens, the, the moon just barely covers the sun up. If the moon were a little smaller or a little farther away, it wouldn't do it at all. If it were larger or closer to us, it would be grossly overtotaled. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these eclipses are, are spectacular and rare, and this is the only planet on which it matters. And it's the only planet on which it happens. Mm -hmm. And you've got to think either just that's the way the world is for no apparent reason, or the world is that way for a purpose and design. And to me, that speaks of creation. Okay, high overhead here we have the great square of Pegasus. It's this big rectangle. Mm -hmm. Now, coming off of Pegasus is a real fuzzy spot right there. Oh, you see, see that? Yeah. That's the Andromeda galaxy. That is the most distant oh. object that you can see with the naked eye. It's a little, we think, a little over 2 million light years away, and it contains a couple hundred billion stars. Wow. Okay, Danny, that brings me to a big question, and a big question in a lot of people's minds. If we have stars that are that far away, millions of light years away, and if the Earth is young, as we believe, then how in the world can the starlight be here? Yeah, we call this the, the light travel time problem, and I'll try to phrase it for you a little, little differently. Uh, we believe that the creation is only thousands of years old, uh, say 6,000 years, 7,000 years, something like mm -hmm. that. And I've just pointed out something to you that we think is two million light years yes. away from us. Yeah. I think those distances are reasonably correct. And uh, we creationists need to answer this question, and we've offered several different solutions to that. I'll discuss with you my solution okay. on this. Several, several things jump out at me in the creation account. One, there's a lot of process going on, very rapid process, but still process. Uh, if you look at the day three account, it talks about plants rising up out of the ground. It says, let the earth bring forth these mm -hmm. plants and the earth brought forth. I think if you would have been there, it would have looked like a time-lapse movie. Mm. Growth that might take normally decades taking place in a matter of minutes or hours at the most. Uh, normal growth abnormally fast. Mm -hmm. I believe you can interpret one day of creation in terms of another day. So I turn to the day four account. Not much information is given there, but I think God also rapidly made the stars and other astronomical bodies. And then in order for them to fulfill mm -hmm. their function to be seen, mm -hmm. he had to rapidly bring forth that light just as he brought plants and matured them quickly. Mm -hmm. He had to bring that light here. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting when we actually look at these objects, like the Andromeda galaxy we saw a few minutes ago, we're looking at light that actually left that object. Yes. So I think there's a rapid maturing took yeah. place. Danny, are there some other things that you see that would point to a young universe? I think so. For instance, uh, spiral galaxies. The Andromeda galaxy we talked about is a yeah. spiral galaxy our own is. And uh, the inside of the galaxies should spin faster than the outside of the galaxy. So after a few rotations, you ought to wind up or smear out those uh, spiral mm. patterns. They ought to disappear after a few rotations. Now, most astronomers think that spiral galaxies are 10 billion years old. So why do we still see spiral patterns? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't see those. Right. And it's been a long recognized as a problem. 
but also if we look at the um, outer planets of the solar system, the gas giants, they all have rings. And uh, we also know that these things are changing, they're wiping out. They've actually documented changes that have taken place within mm. the ring system. You have all these gravitational tugs from the other satellites orbiting around. So these uh, ring systems are fairly young. Doesn't prove the solar system is young, but it proves that yeah. these ring mm -hmm. systems are young. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. We've well, mentioned a, a lot of theories about the spirals and, and so forth. Uh, it brings us to what most people see as the big theory concerning cosmology and the universe, and that's the Big Bang. Uh, how do you see that? Is it holding up over time? No, I don't think so. I think it's, it's getting some problems. Mm. Uh, so much so that uh, more than a dozen years ago, I think in the New Scientist magazine, there was an open letter protesting the Big Bang Theory, and it's had hundreds of signatories mm. since. And most of the people signing it are atheists. They're not even so creationists. So this uh -huh. idea that the Big Bang model is universally accepted is not true. There are many people out mm. there, well, well-known people, very famous physics and astronomy people, that have real problems with the Big Bang. And, and I don't see any way that you can reconcile Big Bang with the Bible, though a lot of people seem to think that you can. I think the temptation they have there is to try to interpret uh, Scripture in terms of the current cosmological thinking. That's nothing new. That's happened before, as it's turned out, with disastrous results. So I, I think when you look at the history of science, the way we've discarded theories over time, you've had theories that were supposedly uh, beyond dispute and then later on discarded. Yeah. Uh, when you see that lesson from history and then you want to wed Genesis, you want to interpret Genesis in terms of the ruling paradigm, I think you need to be very careful. I realized Danny was reorienting our perspective. We need to interpret the universe in terms of Genesis, not the other way around. And Genesis tells us that God created the sun, moon, and stars to be a magnificent clock to track the passage of time. Even the ancients built towers to follow the stars. But what does Genesis say about those people and the languages they spoke? Doug took me to one of the best archaeological museums in the world to show me some of the unique artifacts that relate to Genesis. Well, the events of the Bible are unfolded in the ancient Near East, so all of these lands are extremely important to understanding uh, how and what took place in the biblical text. So this picks up these events we've been looking at in, in Genesis, from creation and the flood, and now we're to the dispersion of mankind out of Noah and his family. Exactly. And the dispersion would have taken place somewhere in this mountain range to the northwest of Mesopotamia. And what we see in the biblical text in the narrative is that a number of people have migrated uh, down to southern Mesopotamia, the land of Shinar, and moved toward the process of urbanization, mm -hmm. city living. And that's the famous Tower of Babel. Absolutely. Do we know where that is? There are about seven or eight Babels, cities of Babel, hmm. in the ancient area of Mesopotamia. And so one at a time, I've studied all of those areas and found only one that meets all the criteria of the famous site of the Tower of Babel. Hmm. And that is the site of Eridu, which is in southeastern Mesopotamia. We have signs of the expansion to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, all the way as far as Egypt. And when you say evidence, uh, that is the artifacts that we find in these archaeological digs? Exactly. There's an enormous uh, amount and very specific kinds of material culture that attest to this expansion of people that I'm connecting to the post-Babel dispersion. Uh, here are the bevel rim bowls, these two, mm -hmm. which is that rimkin brick that we see up oh, there, yeah. mm -hmm. and those two spouted jars. All of these diagnostic forms of pottery and material culture, they're found throughout the Near East. The Bible describes an event that's not just the confusion of language, but it's the dispersing of people far from that city. And because we see language or, or the written expression of language just pop up out of nowhere, hmm. and then different languages being represented through cuneiform script or through hieroglyphic script or, or other means. So you do not have a universal plan that's followed among all of the languages. You see great diversity in the forms of grammar 
from language to language, even in ancient languages. It, it seems then that the event recorded in Genesis about the Tower of Babel, that's a very, very critical event for archaeology. It is. So all of this fits perfectly with what we would see as the biblical account of how languages took place. It's, it's really the only way of explaining this. So the integrity of biblical history ultimately is justified by the expression of these languages. Now, most of us think today of a, a tower, the kinds of things we see in big cities, you know, big straight walls. Is that what they were building? Well, essentially, it's a variation of a pyramid. And there were four sides to it and several stairways that would go up to the top. Oh. At Eridu, we have a temple that existed in 18 different phases. And in every phase, it grew in its size and its oh. complexity. Uh -huh. And that final temple, that final phase of the temple, it was abandoned immediately, right at the time of the late Uruk expansion. Mm -hmm. Catacorner to the temple was an absolutely enormous platform. Do you think that could be the foundation of the Tower of Babel? Absolutely, and I would suggest to you that this mm. later Rook expansion, where this technology began, was something that spread with the people. We find forms of these ziggurats all around the globe. We find them in China, we find them in India, we find them in various parts of the Americas, mm. we find them all over. Well, obviously we have evidence here of civilization and people beginning to gather together in communities, even cities. Do we have any other evidence of that? Absolutely. We can move forward to the time of Abraham oh. because we know that Abraham lived at the site of Ur, which was also in southern Mesopotamia, at the end of the third millennium BC. Yeah. That brings us to the end of Genesis chapter 11. Exactly. In fact, you see some pottery, some cuneiform tablets, all dating to the period of the third dynasty of Ur. It's amazing just as we're sitting here thinking about that, you know, thinking uh, about Abraham and that this represents the culture and the civilization that he lived in. It's a great tie to that record in Genesis 4. It is fascinating and it gives you a feeling of putting your hands around the events that go on in the right. biblical text. Yeah. When I look back through history, I realized each of these cultures had been impacted by the events recorded in Genesis. But what is the importance of Genesis to us today? George Grant wanted to meet me at a garden near his home. He said it was a good reminder of where our history began. So there's something significant about the Genesis text in which Adam and Eve are then placed into a garden to tend it. Uh, that's more than just a story. It's much more than just a story. One of the things that you see in Genesis chapter 1 is the structure for time. Uh, the universe is created for a 24-hour day. And so everything from the way our sleep cycles and the way our work cycles work all come from that definitive historical account there. When we get to uh, Genesis chapter 2, we start to see the meaning and purpose of man. Of course, in Genesis chapter 3, we see the disruption of everything by the fall. And the implications of an historical fall, an actual man and an actual woman who actually yielded to actual sin, have then implications all through the rest of the Bible. If you remove a literal Adam and Eve, that that changes the whole shape of what history is and how history is remembered. Is that because when we pull an Adam and Eve out of a historical record, we can then pretty much make up what we think about man and marriage and even sexuality? Absolutely. The Apostle Paul understood the events of the uh, early chapters of Genesis as formative, not only for our understanding of history, but for relationships between men and women and their children, uh, the character and nature of marriage, uh, rightness and wrongness in moral relations, including sexuality. All of that is assumed from those early chapters of Genesis, oftentimes quoting the passages verbatim. 
it, it seems that even Peter is taking that event of the flood, for example, as a historical event and laying it in the context of what he's pointing to, a judgment that will, that will come. So even judgment is a part uh, of understanding that historical record. You cut things off from history and you lose sight of the meaning of all of it. I think most Christians, uh, when we talk about, uh, for example, the life of Christ, those are understood to be historical accounts. Why is it that when we look at the account in Genesis that we have a tendency not to want to do that? We have a tendency not to do it because we're constantly exhorted to not see it that way. From the culture around us? The culture around us, uh, from theologians, uh, modern theologians who are trying to somehow, in their minds, uh, fit the truths of Scripture with uh, the so-called discoveries of science, uh, which if you know anything about the history of science, you know is an incredibly unreliable mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly bombarded with this message that we have to adjust our view. But I think there are a lot of Christians who have a sense that the historicity of Genesis is just not that important to their Christianity. I, I think we've been sold a bill of goods on that. When you somehow make those chapters a different category altogether and non-historical, what are you doing to all of the rest of the Bible? The Bible that assumes that it's true, the Bible that treats it as historically true, uh, the Bible that refers back to all of the characters that are there, does that then negate the whole of the Bible? Well, yes. And that's exactly what the strategy was of the higher critics in the 18th and 19th centuries. They knew if you could somehow attack the first three or the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you've done away with the whole thing. Well, George, all of this brings us back then to the notion that the history uh, that's recorded in Genesis, or any true history at all, is critical for us in terms of understanding what's going on around us. Yeah, in, in fact, it reminds us of how important history is in anchoring all of the other human disciplines. Uh, it is history that helps to inform science so that science can begin its journey of discovery in the world. So what history does is it tells us what happened. Then what science attempts to do is it, it asks the question, well, how did it happen? And then it, it, it begins to explore the how, the mechanics, the structures uh, that were present in those events. If you try and reverse that, if you try and make science uh, saying what mm -hmm. actually happened, uh, then you, you wind up having a worldview that is constantly shifting where nothing is certain. And moral relativism is the necessary outcome. And God has given us that bedrock. He's given us that foundation in that historical record. He's given it to us in that historical record, going all the way back to Genesis chapter one, and the garden. In the end, I suppose we always return home. And for me, home is Colorado. I always think more clearly when I'm out in the beauty of God's creation. We've been a lot of places and seen a lot of things, but considering everything together, it's clear that nothing in the world makes sense except in the light of Genesis. I love being in the mountains especially ones like these. They help give us a good perspective, help us realize that we're small and finite and vulnerable. They humble us. And we need to be humbled because we have a tendency to base our ideas on our own small set of experiences. That's why the wisdom of the ages has told us over and over again to know history. Everything that we have done up to this point has looked at the evidence that shows us that the Word of God, the history that has been laid down for us in Genesis is true. God created the world in six days. There is a real Adam, a real Eve. There is a real fall. There is a real flood. 
that destroyed the world and produced all of this. It is glorious, but it represents the judgment of God. Everything supports what God has told us. Genesis is history, true history. 